more funny. Never mind. Le uh, back back to our uh, lecture. Back to our class. So, we have looked at market design, and we have seen that regulation aimed at improving market liquidity can quite often backfire by distorting agents' incentives and um, uh, reducing market liquidity, market depth in the end. So reducing tick size can increase liquidity for small orders. Thank you, Benny. At least somebody is adhering to local traditions. Uh, decreasing tick size can improve liquidity for small orders, but not for large orders. Adding a dealer can work in mysterious ways. And uh, now it's time for a shameless plug because breaks are for commercials, but give me a second, I want to do this properly. If you like to know more about market design, why not take a mechanism design course the coming fall semester? You will learn how to manipulate and distort agents' incentives in order to generate the behavior that uh, you actually want in a given market or any other environment. So that's a course I'm teaching in fall. It's more theory-based, so we're going more slowly. We can actually go deeper into the models there. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I can slowly and clearly explain, hopefully clearly, explain uh, all the math rather than just babbling all about the um, graphs and very vague and very simplified models. So that was our quick ad break. And also, the, we will touch upon another aspect of market design which is market fragmentation. So is it better or worse to have many different markets uh, that trade in the same asset? We will do this next week, next Wednesday. But in the meanwhile, it's time to move on to dynamic analysis of limit order book markets. And ask the question of how do traders actually decide whether to uh, take or make liquidity? whether to submit limit or market orders. Because so far, uh, in our in our Glostons model, we just had this, the roles were fixed. We had limit traders, we had market traders, but the roles are not actually fixed in reality. So the main trade-off in... Um, in this choice, in this uh, choice between limit orders and market orders is as follows. So if a trader submits a market order, they get their order executed pretty much immediately, but at a price that is currently offered to the mark by the market. While submitting a limit order can yield a better price to the trader as compared to market order because this price will be on the other side of the spread right but it's not a cure all because there is a cost to submitting a limit or a limit order in particular in the best case the trader who submitted a limit order will have to wait until their order is executed and that is if it is actually executed. So there is always a non-execution risk, which intuitively you would think is very different from delay, but in reality you can think of it as a infinite delay in execution. So this is more or less the same thing. And we should also not forget about adverse selection, meaning that when you are submitting a limit order, you are prone to um, being picked off by other informed traders who manage to obtain some information uh, before, yeah, before they submit the market order. 
Okay, so there are a few models of this dynamic analysis of this uh, choice between market and limit orders. Uh, we will look at a model by Christine Parler. And the textbook also covers very briefly a model by Foucault. And I guess, yeah, now is the time to uh, discuss differences between the two because we will not have any uh, any more. And we have a question in chat. Why are market orders not subject to winner's curse? It is a legit question and I was thinking about it uh, while I was saying it. So there is definitely a grain of truth to it. Y you can think of it as... Um, The winner's curse stems from the extra information that arrived during this delay. So if you are if you are submitting a market order, you are kind of trading again assuming that limit traders are competitive. You are trading in a market uh, at a, at a price that uh, reflects more or less a given expected valuation conditional order size. Although it's not really true in limit order book markets. So you are not, um, you are not trading against someone who has uh, this private information. But it is, it is actually true, and we discussed this, that uh, you do not need to trade with a more informed trader in order to lose from informed trading because all these costs uh, can be transmitted to other agents in the trade so it is it is true and i take this point that we should not focus that much on adverse selection being a separate factor in this choice in this choice between limit and market orders okay so going back to different models of this choice. Uh, we'll look at Parler's model. And in this model, there will be no adverse selection. So the choice will only be based on delay and non execution risk. Foucault's model does both. So he has in that model both non execution risk and um, adverse selection and there is um, one more model cited in the textbook probably because textbook is written by Foucault and in this model um, so sorry just to take a step back all of these models try to figure out which traders submit which kind of orders so who submits market orders who submits uh, limit orders and we will see some answer to that uh, this last paper by Foucault, Caden, and Kendall provides a different answer that we will not see. And they say that, well, patient traders place limit orders and impatient traders place market orders. So in their model, traders explicitly differ in their patience and their discount factors. So we will not go there. Now, disclaimer from the very beginning proper dynamic analysis of limit order book markets is really really difficult because it's um, there are there are a lot of moving parts so if we take a trader who arrives today to to this market and decides and chooses between market and limit order what is this choice based on well, first of all, of course, it depends on the current state of limit order books, of the limit order book, meaning on the price that the market is willing to offer for the market order. This will depend the attractiveness of market order. The attractiveness of a limit order will depend on, well, on the execution probability of a limit order, right? On so that non-execution risk and delay risk. And that in turn also depends on how thick is uh, the existing limit order book 
but it will also depend on what the next trader will do. Because if you submit a limit order, you want the next trader to use a market order so that he would trade against your limit order, right? That reduces the delay. So if you think that everyone after you will also submit limit orders, limit orders are not an appealing option anymore. So there is this dynamic dependence on future agents' choices. And their choices in turn also depend on execution probability, so on choices of agents after them, and so on. So this is a difficult dynamic loop. On the other hand, once again, the um, my choice today, the attractiveness of limit order today, might also depend on adverse selection I face by submitting my limit order, meaning who will trade against my limit order? In which future states of the world will my limit order be executed? So will I only get to sell my asset when it's cheap, when it gets cheap? Or will I be able to sell uh, my asset, you know, in, in any state of the world? So in a sense, this is a slightly different... Yeah, th this is the difference between limit and market orders. Because with market orders, you get to sell your assets kind of uniformly across possible valuations of V. So exposure to adverse selection is slightly different in the two. But then again, so my exposure to adverse selection from submitting the limit order today will depend on future agents choices between market and limit orders once again. And it will depend on traders with which information will decide to submit market orders and which will decide to submit limit orders. So once again, the dependence on future agents' decisions is very complicated and um, this loop is not really very easy to disentangle or to close down. So what we will do is we will look at a very, 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 very simple model. And just as we did with Gloston, we will look at a model that kind of captures the general idea of uh, Parler's paper, but it might not be exactly the model that is contained in that paper. And this model looks as follows. So we have completely exogenous prices. We have our ask price and bid price set somehow, for some reason. I told you, I promised you the model is very, very simplified. So the prices are fixed. Uh, and the fundamental value V is, well, either unknown to everybody or equivalent equally unknown to everybody, meaning that everyone gets more or less the same, has the same information about V. And in each period, one trader arrives and this trader decides whether to submit a limit or a market order for one unit of the asset. So if the trader submits a market order, it will be executed against, well, currently existing limit orders and if there are none, you can think that there is a kind of a dealer who is always willing to trade at these prices, A and B. So if the trader submits market order, he trades today. If the trader submits a limit order, it will be valid for one period. And so this limit order will only be executed if the next trader will submit a market order that exactly offsets this limit order. So if our trader today decided to submit a limit order to sell, then it will only execute if the next trader submitted a market order to buy. Right? Not a market order to sell. And uh, so as we just discussed, this choice will depend on the probability of limit order being executed. Uh, so the, the, the probability of it being executed will be strictly less than 1. 
and delay is always one period or infinity, so we will not focus on delay explicitly. This will just be a model about the non-execution risk. Now, the feature of this model is uh, creating heterogeneity across traders without giving them asymmetric information. So in particular, we assume that each trader's valuation is given by V plus Y. And here V is the fundamental value of the asset that everyone agrees upon, right? So it's, it's either known or nobody has any private information about it. And Y is this particular trader's idiosyncratic valuation for the uh, asset. So here traders have different valuations for the asset, but not because they have different information about V. It's just for some other reason, for liquidity reasons. Uh, I, I really, really need to buy or sell this asset. Or it is for uh, risk management purposes. So I really want to get this asset because it will hedge me it will hedge the risks present in my current portfolio and vice versa and so on. So every trader will have, will have this idiosyncratic component Y. Uh, for simplicity, if we are going simple, we'll just say that it's uniformly distributed on some interval. So it's centered around zero and um, it's independent across traders. It's unobserved to other traders, but it is observed to uh, the traders themselves. So I will know my why, but I will not know your why. And once again, V is known in common to all. So if we write our probabilities of limit order tr uh, trades to be executed, namely we'll have PBM to be the probability that in the next period a market order to buy will arrive and PSM is the probability that a market order to sell will arrive in the next period. Now we do not know what these probabilities are, they'll be determined in equilibrium and uh, that's what we, these are actually the unknowns that we are looking for, part of them. So if we introduce this notation we can write the payoff from different strategies as this. So if I submit a market order to sell today, then I trade at the best bid, meaning B. I, uh, I receive price B, I get, I part with the asset that's worth V plus Y to me as the profit. If I submit a limit order to sell, however, then my limit order is submitted at the ask price, at A. So if I get to sell the item, it will be sold for more. A is greater than B, right? Ask is above the bid. But I will get this profit A minus V minus Y with probability PBM which will be strictly below one. And so you can do all this for uh, the buy side as well. So let us try to go to the graph once again. We'll get rid of this, we'll get rid of this. Clone the clear sheet once again. Okay, uh, so if we draw this payoff function, what will we have? So this will be our V plus Y. Slowly and carefully. And on the Y axis we will have profits from submitting different kinds of orders. <clears throat> so going from top to bottom, I do not have the expressions here anymore. Um, I thought that maybe I should figure out some way to have parts of the slides and and uh, graphs on the same scene, but 
I couldn't be bothered with that. So, but you have slides in front of your eyes, so you can look at these uh, profits from submitting different kinds of orders. And if you draw them, you'll have four linear lines that will look something like this for given values of A, B, and the two probabilities. So profit from a market sell order will look something like this. This will, the intercept will be at B. Uh, profit from a mark, from a limit order to sell will be given by this. And this intercept is given by A times P B M. So this is limit order to sell. Then once again turn into limit order to buy. You'll have something like this. Profit will be increasing V plus Y. And the intercept will be B times P S M. And finally, market order to buy will have something like this. So all of these are supposed to be straight lines. Don't be deceived by my shaking hands. Uh, so this was limit order to buy. This was market order to buy, the lowest one. And the intercept is, uh, oh, these are actually negative. This is minus A minus V PSM. So these are profits from submitting different orders. And our trader, like any rational agent, will choose the one among the four, which gives the highest, <clears throat> sorry, the highest expected profit. Meaning that if our y is such that v plus y lies in this region, our trader will submit a market order to sell. Let me try again. Something like this. If v plus y is in this region, the highest profit is generated by the limit order to sell. And you see the pattern, but I will continue just to, just for completeness. If V plus Y is in this region, then the optimal thing to do is to submit a limit order to buy. Like this. And uh, what is a reasonable color to continue? I don't even know. If V plus Y is greater than this, horrible brown, uh, the optimal thing to do is to submit a market order to buy. It's probably not very visible compared to black. And voila! So you see that the trader will submit different orders depending on their Y, on their idiosyncratic valuation for the asset. The guys who have a really, really big Y, the brown ones, will want to buy it immediately. They will not want to risk not buying the asset because they really, really need it. They have this large Y, they have high valuation for the asset, they really need to get it. So they will want to buy, they will submit a market order to buy. Those with um, Y's idiosyncratic valuations high but not so high, they will still want to buy the asset because their Y is high, but they do not need it that much to pay the full ask price for it. So they will take a risk and they will submit a limit order to buy, so that's our red line, and um, they will take a risk of non-execution for a chance to trade at a better price. So they'll get to buy the asset at the bid price B, which is lower than A, which is better for these traders. 
and so on. So those guys with low Ys will want to sell. And once again, those with really low Ys, with the lowest among those, will really, really, really want to sell. They have really negative, very, very low value from holding the asset. So they'll be willing to sell it urgently at a low bid price. Those with mildly low idiosyncratic valuations Y will want to sell it at... Um, will take a risk of non-execution and trade at the S price. A. So let's go back to the slides. This is what this slide says. So we just found out that this is the optimal strategy. These are the types of orders depending on Ys. So here we have uh, some new annotation. We have Y bar, Y underline, Y hat, and Y bar in all these different places. And these, just going back to the graph, are these breakpoints. I'm... I did not leave any space here below, but let me try to do it. So this edge between purple and blue regions will be given by V plus Y bar. This is not a great Y bar, but I hope uh, it's readable. So this middle one will be given by V plus Y hat. Also not great. And this red one is V plus Y bar. Fantastic handwriting. I should have been a should have gone to calligraphy. <clears throat> so this is it. And once again, traders with greater urgency to trade use market orders. And um, if we look at how those lines, those profit lines change depending on market circumstance, in particular on um, on the probabilities of limit order execution, you will see that limit orders are more attractive when they are more likely to execute, which broadly speaking means that the limit order book is thinner just in the real world, not in this model, because our limit order book is always either a zero or one asset. So our limit trader has no competition. But in the real world, limit orders are more attractive when they are more likely to execute when limit order book is thin, meaning that the fewer, the thinner is the limit order book, the deeper it is, the, the thicker it is. So it is automatically replenished. It is a self-balancing system. And so there is this resiliency in the market. Resiliency is a feature of limit order books. They do get automatically replenished. Okay, so we have not still found this equilibrium exactly, right? We just drew a graph and we saw that this is the optimal best response. We still need to find what exactly these cutoffs, Y, are. And we need to find out what the probabilities are. And we can do this, so given the distribution of Y, the idiosyncratic component of valuations, the probability of next order, of next trader submitting a market order to sell will be given by the probability of Y being very, very negative. So that was the leftmost region in our graph. Yes, let's look at it. So the probability of next mar of next trader submitting a market order to sell is the probability that his Y is in this purple region. In terms of math, this means that Y should be between minus Y and Y underline, which with uniform distribution gives us this expression, Y underline plus Y over 2Y. Similarly, we can compute probability of the next order being market order to buy. 
which is equivalent to the probability of y being between um, above y bar and below the highest possible value y. And this probability with uniform distribution will be given by this. So these are our expressions for probabilities in terms of these uh, cutoffs for y. And we find these cutoffs for y from the indifference points. So once again, jump into the graph, we see that these, for example, y hat is determined as an indifference point, sorry, as such valuation y, at which the trader is indifferent between submitting a limit order to sell and a limit order to buy, meaning the expected profits between the two should be equal. So if we take this equality and we write it down, we will be able to find out y hat from that equality. Or, actually not quite, we will have to write down all three indifferences for all three breakpoints. And if we solve this system, we will be able to find the cutoffs. Here, we have already substituted in the probabilities of execution. So these fractions come from here, where we computed the probabilities. And uh, that's it. That's how you solve this simplified model. That's how you find the equilibrium. And to give you a simple example, if we choose some random numbers, so we said v equal to 0, y equal to 2, a equal to 1 and b equal to minus 1. What we will have is um, y underline will be 1, 4, y bar will be minus 1.4. I realize I might have confused uh, y underline and y bar in the graph that I had. So if I did, the slides should be correct. I haven't checked them carefully, but they should be correct and the graph might not be correct. Okay, so the takeaway here, uh, given that y, the idiosyncratic component can be between minus 2 and 2, traders with only very extreme valuations, so between minus 2 and minus 1.4, .4, will submit a market order to uh, sell. Only those with the very highest valuations y between 1.4 1, 1 and 2 will submit market orders to buy. And uh, there will be very few market orders. And so the probability of execute... Th this will mean that the probability to execute a given limit order will be very low. So the probability that the next trader will submit a market order to buy will be just 15% or a market order to sell. Meaning that those l traders who submit limit orders, they are really taking this huge risk. Their limit order is only executed with about 15% probability in this example. But they are willing to take this risk because they, the price improvement that they get is really large. So our spread is equal to 2 they get um, their unit $2 cheaper. Which, I guess there is no real scale in this example. But, um, and I don't even know what to compare it to, what to tie it to. I guess Y is the only other scale uh, variable. But yeah, so... In this example, this spread is large. So the price improvement that one can get from submitting a limit order instead of market order is quite sizable. And uh, low execution probability is worth it for limit traders. So this is it for Parler's model. This model that we had kind of summarizes the main or models really love roughly um, the main trade-off that the 
traders have when choosing between limit orders and market orders. Now, as I said, you can come up with a model that also has adverse selection on top of non-execution risk. So in this model, we tried really hard to avoid, to avoid adverse selection. There was no private information here. And uh, in the textbook, in chapter 6.5, this model is explored. Also, I have a couple of slides in the deck that explore it. You can look at them on your own. I do not want to really go there into this model because it does not really add anything to what we've seen so far from exploring these two issues separately, from exploring adverse selection in Gloston's model and exploring non-execution risk in Parler's model. So they do not really interact, these two frictions, in any way. But once again, you're welcome to look at these on your own. And I believe this is all I have to tell you today. So to summarize, we looked, we continued looking at limit order book markets. We looked at a few aspects of market design and uh, we saw that regulation that's intended to improve market liquidity and market depth can backfire. So you've got to be really careful if you ever become a policymaker or um, a high executive in any exchange or trading platform. Or, you know, if you become on the user side of all these platforms, on the uh, trader side, then you will be able to lobby for and against given changes by maybe using some of these models. So another question in chat from Siv, uh, not really important. However, will you update the course plan? It is stated that in week seven, we should inspect chapter seven. You are absolutely correct. I changed that and I uh, completely forgot that we have a course plan. Uh, yeah, out there. I will update it. Thank you for reminding me. I completely forgot about that. So we are basically yeah, shifting one lecture back. So this week and last week, we really did what was supposed to be covered in one week in, in the course plan, but it was a bit too much, so I split it in two. So yeah, we'll cover chapter seven next week. We will talk about market fragmentation and whether it is good or bad, or not good or bad, but what are the costs and benefits of having the same asset traded in possibly different platforms. So we'll do that next week. And that, I guess, will feed uh, into the discussion on market design. But the other thing we did today was looking at the choice the traders have between facing and between taking and making liquidity. And we see that the, the, um, the simplest model of that, we saw a simplest model of that in which traders, um, the impatient traders, in a sense, submitted market orders, those who really wanted to trade, and uh, the patient orders submitted limit, uh, limit orders. Anything else? Okay, so that's conclusion. One exercise for you to work on your own if, uh, if I did not give you enough stuff to look on your own already. Uh, if you are bored in quarantine, you're welcome to solve exercise five in chapter six on page uh, 235 of the textbook. So it explores the effect of fees charged for limit orders and market orders. And I believe, I, to be honest, it was a while. It's been a while since I looked at this exercise. I believe it deals with the parallel model. At least that was my note for it. So it should be relevant to what we did in this lecture. And uh, moreover, fees charged for orders are, I guess, one more aspect of market design. So it should be doubly relevant for what we did this week. But apart from this, yeah, this should be it. I'll stick around for a minute if you have any questions. You're welcome to ask them. Otherwise, the slides are online. I will update the course plan. And I will see you next week to talk about market fragmentation.